Thank you very much for having me. I'm very glad to be here. Um, it's very nice to see uh, young people. I was saying to uh, your professor here that it's nice to see everybody dressed up, and I appreciate that. Um, you guys look like you're all ready for the business world, and uh, um, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit later. But I think it's, uh, it's really nice to see everybody uh, respectfully um, dressing up, um, which you don't see very often, and even in the business world. So uh, but it's great to see that. Um, the title, and I know you guys have been talking about lecture series, and I don't really want this to be a lecture. Um, I'd like to just share some ideas with you, and if there's um, an opportunity, please feel free to raise your hand and talk. Um, I would like this to be a little more interactive as opposed to just lecturing. Um, I've been around the economic development field for a long time, and we can go into that. I know you guys are business-oriented. Um, so there's a lot to talk about when you talk about projects and financial strategies on putting projects together, um, all the way from concept through financing, through development, and then through implementation. And that does take um, you know, quite a bit of effort and concentration and a bunch of partners. But because the, um, the idea today is to talk about leadership, I did want to talk about what leadership has to do with all these economic and community development projects. Um, as I said, I've been at this for over 25 years, and I've worked in probably every third-class city in this Commonwealth. And a third-class city is, is a designation by the Commonwealth. If you look it up in the Municipal Planning Code, it isn't based totally on population, but it is based on a variety of things like government. Uh, population is some of it, but you can have a third-class city as small as Monongahela, which only has a few thousand people, and then you have a borough as large as Conshohocken, which is uh, over 200,000 people, and that's still a borough. That is not a third-class city. But third-class cities would be Erie, Warren, uh, Lancaster, Harrisburg, York, Lebanon. Those are th third-class cities with a mayor and a council form of government. So I've been working in those, and they're generally urban. Um, there are some third-class cities up in um, the, up above Route 80, uh, but generally those are urban cores or urban um, you know ur urban areas that have high-density population in the middle, and then you know uh, the things that go on in, in cities like like York, Harrisburg, Lancaster. Um, so I've been doing a lot of that over the years, and then I, 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 as we said, I was a mayor, mayor of a third-class city, which is Lebanon. Um, and I think when we talk about that leadership and that interaction with the neighborhoods, with the community, with the residents, um, that's really what I'd like to focus on. Because all of you in your realms and in your world will most likely have an opportunity to be leaders. Um, there's a difference between leading and administration. And all of you can, can talk about being a business administrator, and we all need those. We need the people who are organized, who can do spreadsheets, who can do grids, who can do um, you know, deliverables when it's time for a project. What are we going to give you? And uh, believe me, I'm, uh, I have great staff, and they are great at giving me when I say, hey, can you help me with a, a graph? Can you help me with a grid? Can you help me with a pie chart or a presentation? And they're very good at those kinds of detail-oriented things. And people, we need people like that, and we need people to be good administrators. So as you rise up from your, from your entry-level position and you take on more responsibility, how do you administrate? How do you delegate? How do you do reports and make sure you're organized, your calendar's organized, your life is organized, your schedule's organized? And we all do need good administrators. But we really also need good leaders. And that, I think, is where um, it can't be taught. I don't think leadership can be taught, but I think that you can observe and you can be involved and you can think about how you become a leader in your own realm, in your own world. And all of you here on the college campus, I'm sure you have opportunities to lead. Um, there's student government, there's um, your hall probably has a, a hall government, and whether or not you're active now. When I was in college, um, I wasn't very active really on campus, campus life. I like to play pinochle and you know, go drinking like everybody else. Um, so I didn't really pay much attention to student government at that time. I did help a couple of my, my classmates you know, run for things and campaign for things, and I think that was, you know, that was fun. It was, it was certainly interesting, and some of my um, colleagues won and, and some, some lost. 
Um, actually, that one year I was there, and I, you guys are way too young to remember this, but at Notre Dame, because I was at St. Mary's College, Notre Dame was the male college, St. Mary's was still all female, and that year we elected, uh, Notre Dame elected a king, and the vice president was a cat. So that's, that was that student government that, yeah, it was, in, it was even in uh, one of the, you know, Time magazine that they elected the king, a guy that was a king, and then they had the cat out on the fire escape. So I, that was student government at that time. Um, so, you know, those are the, you know, so that's, that's, you know, as you, you know, go out in your college campus life and you think about governing and you think about being involved. Okay, so how do you get involved? So, or how do you think about what, what is around you that you might have an opportunity to lead. And that um, comes from a variety of things. Maybe you have a cause. Maybe you're thinking, hey, this should be changed. Whatever it is, whether it's uh, skateboarding, whether it's hours of, you know, your dorm, you know, says you're, you've got to close at two, and then you're saying, why do you have to close at two? Maybe you close at three. I mean, there's just different things. I mean, when I when I was growing up, it was pr I had parietals, and they, you know, we had to, everybody had to be in at midnight. So, um, but maybe there are things that you need to change that are around you. Maybe it's a park. Maybe you say, well, this this old dump, this trash dump, should be a park. Why can't it be green space? Or maybe you question why something is happening, and that really is the beginning of what you need to do to get out and lead. Now, you don't always have to lead. Maybe there's somebody who's leading that charge, but someday you will find something. It might be education. It might be, um, you know, again, uh, it might be, um, when I say education, education of your family, you have a little brother, maybe you'll have a child, and you're saying, I, I don't think this is right. I don't think where the school crossing guard is is appropriate. I don't think the bus stop is where it's appropriate. So then you be, kind of become more active, and you say, okay, how do, I, how do I change? How do I change whatever it is I want to change? And that's when you're going to try to dig down deep inside and say, okay, I'm going to be the leader. I'm going to see if I can coalesce a group to say this needs to be changed. Um, you see it on TV. They're, they're you know, protesting Walmarts where they're located, zoning, and we can talk about that business side of zoning and what's allowed and should Walmarts be allowed in a farmland or not. Fracking, you see the pipelines coming through. A lot of people don't care you know, about the pipeline coming through, but there are a lot of farmers and landowners who are very offended by that pipeline. And they're offended because it disrupts the earth. They're offended because it's scarring property. They're offended because they just don't want to see it. But then the other side says, well, I want my natural gas to get to my house. And how is the natural gas going to get to my house cheaply? You've got to do a pipeline. So there's both sides to every story. And what side are you going to take? And are you going to find it within you to say it's important enough? Now, not everything will be important enough. Like I said, so the pipeline goes through somebody else's property, what do you care? Maybe you don't care. Uh, but when it hits you and it's important to you, that's when you're going to have to find those, those skills and to say, okay, I'm going to now organize. I'm going to now do the outreach. I now am going to get knock on doors and get my neighbors to come out and say, hey, that, that trash dump there should be a park. What can we do? Go to city council. Go to borough council. Um, you know, organize yourselves to, to do that. And um, I'm hoping some of you have already done that. Maybe some of you have already done that in your lives, and it's, you know, that, that to me is the beginning of leadership. Um, and like I said, it, it is just something I think that you have to, not, not it is, it does have to do something a little bit with administration because you have to be organized, but it is a little bit different than just administering or delegating. It is actually having that, that, um, drive to to go out and actually lead the charge on something that you feel is important and that affects you. Um, so um, as I wanted to talk about that part, I'm going to talk now about um, uh, the leadership in a community when you do a f an impact project and why it's important and how government now has to build that capacity with neighborhoods that don't have leaders. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm hoping all of you, you're here in a college classroom, you will go out and you will be doing v wonderful things and you'll have those opportunities to, to lead. But what we're seeing now is in urban core areas where there is a high level of poverty, where there's a high level of people who, who are not educated, who haven't been out, who haven't had the opportunities that all of you have, and I'm sure you, all of you have had those opportunities, to, um, to understand how the, 
how when they feel something is important to them, they struggle to get to that leadership position. They struggle to figure out how to get to city council, how to get to borough council, how they can organize their neighbors. They don't understand meeting structure, Robert's rules of order, um, coming, coming on time, you know, that, okay, we'll have a meeting at six, whether they come or not, they don't, you know, so, so that's, you know, that's, that's some of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, any questions on that? Do we have any leaders here? Anybody doing a cause? Chairing a cause? Leading a cause? No? Nothing yet. Nothing's, nothing's hit you yet. That's it. Okay. It will, let me tell you. You get will. Um, I think when you find out, I know that some of, you, some of you are international business people, some of you are regular business people, and you're going to find out in the business workplace, when you, whether you're in the financial uh, workplace, financial business, whether you're retail business, commercial business, whatever your business might be, you will have that opportunity to, you know, when something um, you know, bothers you or offends you or you think, yeah, I could do, we could do that differently, that will be the time when you're going to say, yeah, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to lead this because nobody else is. So um, that, that's going to be, you know, part of your goal. Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit and just talk about public-private partnerships and how the government, because that's what I wanted to talk about, because I do work in the public service arena. So you guys are all business people, and so I don't think that you're going to want, maybe, to be a public servant, because that is exactly what we are. We are public servants. So even if we're elected, um, you know, I'm, I ran for mayor, I ran, I ran for school board of the Lebanon uh, school district, and um, my kids all went to Lebanon High. They played, they played E-Town back in the day uh, in a variety of sports. So, um, you know, there's that public service. And let me tell you, it doesn't pay. So anybody here who's thinking for a big job, public service does not pay very well. Um, but it is certainly the most challenging and rewarding thing that I have ever done is to be in public service because to me it's grassroots, it's in the weeds, it's actually speaking to people to better their lives um, and it's helping those corridors as I was saying that don't have um, either the capacity, the ability, the knowledge to help themselves. Um, so where does government's role, you know, how do we, back up in, in the city of Harrisburg, um, we've got 400 employees, we have police, fire, and we have a variety of other public servants. Um, as we were saying in my, my bio, which is kind of funny, not only do I oversee small business development and, and large housing projects, but um, this mayor just said, okay, under economic development, you're going to have all the parks and playgrounds in the city. So we have 27 parks and playgrounds, and I oversee City Island. I oversee Riverfront Park, Reservoir Park, so all the larger parks fall under me, as well as the, um, the, the little playgrounds that we have. And uh, it's huge. It is huge, and it's a huge um, uh, amount of land. Um, many of the playgrounds have not been taken care of over the years. They're in disrepair. Um, some of them are dangerous. We had to rip out a lot of the equipment. And, you know, when, it, when you look at taxpayers, and again, all of you will be taxpayers, you're all probably taxpayers now, you know, some people just think that, ta that, that green space and parks are at the bottom of the taxpayers list. You know, it's just like, okay, I need a good road, I don't want any potholes, I want to make sure my police and fire are up to date, and the parks, well, whatever. You know, if it's the last thing on the list. But this administration came in and said, okay, we want to concentrate on redoing some of the parks. So we've been able to, you know, to, um, again, to help those neighborhoods that really needed that, those, that park for the kids and help them, you know, rehabilitate those parks. Um, so, so getting into how do we involve the, the neighborhoods? So you're, you know, you're at the city and you're trying to develop these projects. You've got private developers. You've got state money from the Department of uh, Conservation and Natural Resources, DCNR. We work with PennDOT. We work with the Department of General Services. We work with the Department of Environmental Protection. So everybody's at the table. But the most important people to be at the table are the neighbors. The neighbors have to come and they have to say, so you cannot, it cannot ever be top down. It has to be neighborhood involvement. So then it becomes, okay, so we're all up here. We have the money. We have the ideas. We've got this and we want, we want to make sure we, we, we redo these playgrounds. And if you don't have that neighborhood involvement, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. It just can't be driven by 
public servants or public officials. We all have great ideas, but we need to you know, involve the, the community. So in some of those neighborhoods, Allison Hill, Uptown, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Harrisburg, but they are the um, highest density population and the poverty level is at 33% in some of those areas, where the state poverty level is at 17%. So we really have challenges in those neighborhoods. Um, again, the density is there, more families live there, um, and, it, and, and again, it's, 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 it's poor, these are poor areas. So how do you build that capacity? How do you go out to the neighbors? Many of them are single parents, single moms mostly, grandmothers raising children, and um, just trying to make sure they get dinner on the table to get them to be interested in that playground. Now they, they know when they bring their kids there, their grandkids, and they go there and they say, you know what, it's a mess, there's trash, the swings are broken, we pick up needles, we pick up gloves, we pick up all kinds of strange things in these, play, in these playgrounds. So they know that it's not right, but they don't know how to get there to make it better. So our role, you know, and I, my staff and I are always at it, is to make sure that they are engaged. So we do um, social media, of course, everybody's on Twitter, and we have a Facebook page, and we, you know, we, we post all these things, but we also have to do a lot of door-to-door, -door because again, a lot of these people don't have access to computers. They don't have, um, they certainly aren't savvy with tweeting and Facebook, a lot of them, and so we try to do the door-to-door -door knocking, we do flyers, we do handouts, and of course we, we invite them to meetings where we always have food, food is good, you know, should always have food at a, at a neighborhood meeting, and invite them to come and talk about their park. Um, and, but, the, but the idea is to build that capacity in those neighborhoods to make, to let them do it. So we, are, we, do, we try the original organization of a meeting or a couple meetings and say, here's your playground. We have charrettes. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that word. The charrette is a, a planning session, and many, many planners use that term because they bring people together to say, okay, here's your playground. It looks awful. What do you want to do? To, how do you want to fix it up? So then they have pictures, and they say, yep, new, play, new swings here, sandbox here you know, jungle gym over here, and benches, and whatever. And, of course, lighting to make it safe. Those are all things you have to think about. Just make sure it's safe. Um, make sure that people aren't using it at night for drug, you know, drug things and other, other, not, other mischievous things that they do at night. Um, parks are good areas for that. Um, so, are there any of you here who live in urban areas? Anybody here live in a city? Harrisburg? Where do you live? Oh, you live in Lebanon. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, you're, you're a kinsman then. <laughs> so um, um, anybody here, who, anybody else who have an urban, an urban experience? So, you know, the, um, again, so you, you, you go and you try to talk to the neighbors and you bring them together. You, you, you encourage them. So then you have to try to pick those leaders from that group. And you try to say, okay, hey, um, you know, Cheryl, hey, you know, would you like to, would you like to maybe lead the group next time? And, you know, generally the answer is no. They don't want to do that. They don't want to, they know that their park is important, but they don't want to lead because they're afraid. Um, they're certainly afraid of rejection. They're certainly afraid that the neighbors will talk badly about them. They certainly are afraid that something, you know, is going to happen at City Hall because they don't understand how City Hall works. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of our mission is to try to develop that, that rapport and to make sure that there is that, um, not only that engagement, but that capacity. So if it's not Cheryl, then we take Bob or we take somebody else um, to come forward and say, okay, you take minutes um, and you do the flyers next time and we'll help you with an agenda and we'll help you lead the meeting. And I can tell you that it's, it's a struggle. It is really a struggle. Um, so I'm hoping that people like you, um, you know, as you go out in the, in, in wherever worlds you end up, that you find some way to help that because um, it, it, is, it is extremely important and be, you're going to find out that there's, um, as, as time goes on, and again, I, I guess I'm looking into the future, I don't, nobody knows what's going to happen, but I do feel that that group that, of the uh, HABs is going to be that divide between the haves and the have-nots is going to be greater and it's going to grow and so you're going to have a great 
population that will not know how to lead and will not know how to get things done. And so that other, other group is going to have to either help them or do it themselves, which isn't really right. It should be everyone. Everyone should be, should be at the table. Everyone should have some say. But if you don't have that capacity building and you don't engage those people, then, then you're going to lose them. And you, you're going to lose a great deal of the population to help make things better in a community. Um, and and I, you know, I'm talking a little bit too about rural areas, and I know it's different because there's usually townships and township supervisors. And that challenge when you're out there in, in the rural areas or in the suburbs is um, more because you have so much land to cover. So it's harder to go door to door. Like in, in Harrisburg, Lebanon, or York, all the homes are very close together. So going door to door is really easy. But when you're out in the, in the sub suburbia or you're out in the farmland and you have to hit uh, the farm down this lane and the farm down that lane and the you know, development here and development here, it does be, that's, that's a bigger challenge. But hopefully through social media and um, you know, the computers and things like that, it, you, can, you can connect people. Not that you don't have issues. Everybody has issues, uh, even out in the you know, suburbs, traffic patterns, new malls, uh, composting, that's a big deal now. And a lot of people out in the suburbs, not in my backyard, we don't want a composting thing or a, a, you know, a dump or a, a trash area. So um, those are certainly suburban, air, suburban issues that deserve attention, but then how do you get everybody to the table? And, and how do you build that capacity for the people to get to the table to, um, you know, to be involved? So um, getting, you know, going back to the, to the public-private partnership. So I did talk about parks, and that is a very big deal to the neighbors in Harrisburg and, and, and other uh, urban areas. It's really important to them because it affects them. Like I said, things that affect you, are, that's when you're really going to, um, you know, going to be uh, hopefully moved to do something. Um, but when we talk about community and economic development projects, it's the same thing. It's kind of the same thing. We have a Mulder Square up at Mulberry and Dairy Street in the city, and that is a huge housing project. So we demolished probably 20 buildings, and now there's going to be new um, apartments, um, affordable apartments, so there will be um, for means tested so that, that we know that families and people of low to moderate income can access those apartments. And, um, but but it's gonna be, they're going to be new. They're going to be brand new with brand new green space, brand new streetscape. Um, and it'll, it, it really is going to be very significant and impactful for Allison Hill. But again, we had to invite, you know, we have new streetscape. So we want to make sure the neighbors are comfortable with that. And of course, the first thing is, where are we going to park? You know, is there enough parking for everybody on the streets? Because when you have city streets, they're very, they, you know, it's very uh, close. Not a lot of people have driveways. Not a lot of people have garages. And so it's on street parking. So now suddenly it's, where are we going to park? Okay, so that's, that's an issue. So that's really important. Um, and they want to know about walkways and crossways. They want to know, um, you know, the traffic flow in the area. They want to know, uh, you know, is there going to be lighting? Will there be lighting? Will it be safe again? Um, so there's all those things, and we, so we, we have to, again, invite the public. We've had many meetings at churches where we've said, hey, come on in and you know, take a look at this, these drawings. Give us your feedback. Um, and again, have a meeting yourself. Try to, try to bring everybody together. So it's been, a, it's been a challenge, I'd say, in the five years to try to get some new neighborhood groups to form. Um, we do have some crime, we call them neighborhood groups, but they basically are you know, around like a crime watch kind of thing to watch out for the neighbors. But now they're getting more active in their parks and the new development, and they want a say that, you know, I can see that now they're feeling a little more comfortable, so now they want to come out and say, okay, um, you know, I, I really want trees here, and okay, I really want to make sure the sidewalk is, you know, new here. Um, you know, I want to make sure that, um, that what, you know, what the neighbors want is going to be heard. So that's a, that's a big deal. But so even when we do these large projects and we have multiple developers that come to the table, the real key is making sure that the neighborhood is involved and making sure that, um, that, that their issues are heard um, because, it, again, it just can't be top down. Uh, we know that as government, you know, government cannot do these things themselves. Government, you know, we're not the developers. We have to invite our private developers to the table. They're, they're the guys that have the money. Um, so when you're out in the business world, those private people, they have the money. The government only has tax dollars, and they're very limited. 
Um, so we know that we have to have private development at the table. So it's really mixing, uh, making sure that, that public-private partnership is, um, is there so that we can do these new projects. And, and again, I think I've seen anyway that the private sector, the developers are very sensitive to the neighbors. And when it comes time for, when they come in for planning and zoning and they say, hey, can we put this new thing here, whatever that might be, um, you know, what are the neighbors, we, the first thing we say is, are you meeting with the neighbors? You know, you have to meet with the neighbors to see if you're going to change zoning, are you going to impact their traffic, are you going to impact the, the density in some place, and now there's going to be more people, um, you know, how, how, are, how are they involved? So, um, anyway, any questions on that? Involvement? Community involvement? Any of you get involved with anything in your communities? Yeah, what do you do, Nicole? That's cool. And do you get a lot of neighborhood involvement? Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Cool. Anybody else involved with the community? Yes, I went to uh, roadside cleanup before. Uh, we were at one of the flight schools. And also, once in a while, it's sort of, um, it, it used to do this back in the 60s and 70s, but now that's sort of a revive it now. It's a community day, uh, the 4th of July or so. And, you know, sort of a, Yeah, I think, I think those neighborhood events, and again, events falls under me too, I don't know why. But anyway, so we have, we have Capona, we have the 4th of July, and we have block parties. And I think, you know, I think you're right. I think when we just had Earth Day and, uh, of, in Harrisburg, so we cleaned up, you know, every, every, every neighborhood was supposed to form a group and then clean up, and then they had a, you know, like a little block party. And I think that's definitely, definitely important. Again, food, food is important, so if you have a meeting, bring food. Um, and uh, you know that kind of camaraderie, where uh, you know it, I think that really helps. And then suddenly somebody's talking to somebody else, and then they you know say, hey, you know let's let's form a group, or let's see if we can get something you know else done besides you know the first cleanup. So I think that's important. Anybody else? Anybody else involved with any volunteer kind of activities? Habitat, I know Habitat for Humanity and takes volunteers. Yes, Clint. Um, Oh, that's good. And what do you do for the for the homeless? What do you What's your model? Um, we just kind of we live in pairs. We just take care of food. So you're you're at a point, and then you give the food out. You give yeah, the food. Like, like a, there's like three different locations that we're at too. Like the pantry, we got sort of more meals. Like yeah, that's that's a whole other topic we could get into. Is the the homeless population in urban areas. It's, uh, I don't know what the size of the homeless population is in York, but I know in Harrisburg it's, um, it's I wouldn't say it's huge, but um, you know, it depends what kind of homelessness, whether it's chronic or you know, acute or you know, just transitional, those kinds of things. So, so that's good though. Um, be a lot of neighbors there too? Or the, is a church group? It's a church, church or um, I think what we found with um, just talking about, you know, getting people off the porches and things, we have a lot of cleanups in, in Harrisburg where we have some volunteer groups and we have church groups that come in and they'll say, and I've, you know, been out with them and we say, okay, we're going to go on this street and clean up trash. And I don't know if you've <coughs> been in, in Harrisburg, but I have to say um, that Harrisburg has one of the biggest trash problems probably in, of, of all the third class cities in this area. It's, it's not good. Um, we have a lot of illegal dumping, uh, which is a you know is a problem. We have cameras set up <coughs> in certain places, but people know where to where to dump, and they come at night and they dump all their stuff. So we we do have these clean, cleanups, and again going back to involving the the neighborhoods. So when you go in, um, when we go in, so we're we have a group. Maybe it's young people like yourselves, and you go in and you're helping to clean up, <coughs> and the people sit on the porch. So the the people who own the homes or our renters there who live there, people who live on those blocks, they just watch you. They don't get involved. They, they think it's nice that you're cleaning up, but they won't help. So, um, you know, how do you think that we should be engaging the people who sit on the porch and say thank you, but we're not helping? What do we do? Do we keep cleaning? Do we keep going back and cleaning up an area that really belongs to a neighborhood? 
but you know that it's important to clean up, or is, how, can we, how do you think we can get people involved when they don't want to be involved, and they should be involved? Anybody have any thoughts? Yes. I'm sorry? Well, that is a very good point. So the people on the porches say to us, if you pay us, we'll clean up. OK, so I guess that's the way to look at it, if we pay them. These are the people who live there. So you know, it would be great if I sat out on my porch and said, hey, if you pay me, I'll clean up my property. <laughs> but, if I, but if I don't get paid, I'm just going to let it, I'll just, I'll just let the trash sit there. So that's a very, that, you know, incentives is, you know, that's what, we're, that's what we like to hear. I mean, I mean, that's what we, not that we like to hear, that's what we hear is, you know, hey, you pay us. Um, so you've got volunteer groups like you and you and you're in there and you're working really hard. So your group is in there and you're working hard and I'm telling you the trash is bad. So you have to have gloves, you have to have rakes and the, the stuff you're picking up is awful. Um, and then somebody sits on the porch and says, yeah, if you pay me, I'll clean up my property. So it's a, that's a tough one because then you, you, you're thinking to yourself, well, for the good of the neighborhood, maybe there's the person next door is at home or maybe the person next to that is elderly and can't clean up. And so we're, we're thinking, our thought is you're gonna clean up because it's important to the neighborhood and to the community to clean up. But, the, but, but with that is really getting the neighbors to do it themselves without being paid. Because we, we don't have any money to pay people to, to come out and clean if we're having these volunteer groups to do it. Um, maybe another incentive, maybe it is a contest because we talked about that. Um, let's say we pit uh, neighborhoods against neighborhoods and the, and the, you know, the, the uh, prize will be uh, you know, a TV or I, well, it have to be something for everybody. But you know, we're thinking about that. Is there some way to incentivize them in a kind of a competitive way to say, okay, if you clean up this block and you clean up this block and you clean up this block and we'll see who has, does the best job and they get something. Or they get a part, everybody gets a pizza party at the end or everybody gets something. Um, but, you're, but you're totally right. I mean, but I guess in my day, it's, you know, you, we didn't have to incentivize people to clean up their own properties that they took pride in cleaning up their properties. And that's, again, that's part of the capacity building. It's part of getting people to feel motivated so they don't feel they should be paid to clean up their own property. They should feel proud enough. Now, we have a lot of renters, and so maybe they don't care about their properties because home ownership is really a very, very strong um, driver in keeping a neighborhood clean. We have a high rental rate so in Harrisburg the rental rate to home ownership is 60 40 so we have 60 percent renters and only 40 percent homeowners and that's very skewed we you really should have it 60 40 the other way but um, you know so so maybe the lady sitting on the porch says I'm not cleaning up my property I don't even own this place so I don't care um, but um, that is that that is something that you you know that we fight all the time is how to get people to be motivated, to have pride, to say, yep, I wanted to do this because it's important to me, not because I get paid or I have an incentive. Does somebody have a question? Well, that, that is true. We have, code, we have code enforcement and we have codes. But the trash is not really part of that. Now we have, we have a code for emptying your, you know, you, we have uh, city pickups, the so city trash pickups. So there are, yep, you have to have a trash bin and you have to, we have pickups every week. But the trash that's sitting out in front in, the, in your, okay, so you're sitting on your porch and you see the curb because, you know, it's a dense area. So it's row home, row home, row home. And you just see the stuff sitting in the grass and you see the stuff sitting in the gutter. Um, you know, there's, you know, we don't, we, we, we don't even have the time to you know, go up to that person's house and say, is that yours? We don't even know if it's theirs. Somebody could be walking by and just drop it. But we want the people to come out and say, oh, gosh, my front porch looks awful. We're going to clean it up. Or report when there's, when there's, you know, we don't always get reports of illegal dumping until we go down the alleys and we see it. And it's, you know, it's bad. So, um, you know, we are trying to get, and again, those neighborhood groups and neighborhood watch groups, they're the ones now setting up cameras and alleys, setting up cameras like on trees, you know, that, that focus on a, an, an intersection so they can see when somebody's, you know, coming in. And that's when, the, you know, you start to see a little more 
um, camaraderie and, and um, effort by a group to say, okay, I, maybe I can't do it by myself, but I'm going to get the neighbors and we're going to concentrate on that. Um, but yes, code enforcement is absolutely key. Uh, we don't have enough code enforcement officers. Um, if you've seen um, the city of Harrisburg, we have a lot of blighted properties, and so they're out there hammering those people for blight, and, you know, broken windows and, and tall grass and things like that. But the trash issue is, you know, one of, I mean, that's, it's, you know, it's, it's overwhelming almost to, you know, try to, try to code, do codes on, on individuals. Because uh, they're going to say, that's not my trash. That's not mine. So, anyway, any other ideas? Nobody, anybody else faced with any trash problems? Yes. What do you mean get? Yeah. Well, that, that, that I can tell you that's what a lot of people think. It's just hey, let it go. We're not going there again because we already did it. And uh, you know what happens? We clean up. Within a week, it's bad. I'm telling you, it's 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 tough. So, how bad how bad should we let it go? It's it could be bad. And I, and does that is that a motivator? I'm not. I don't know. But we could we could try it. We have enough we have enough neighborhoods to try that kind of thing. I can tell you. Okay, so we talked about, um, we we're talking about the trash, we talked about public-private partnerships. Um, I wanted to also kind of mention, because we're in, in an educational institution, that educational institutions have become strong partners um, with communities. Um, and we've seen it in uh, Lancaster with F&M College. They have begun, they ha actually over the last several years. So they partnered with the hospital, Lancaster General, and they started taking over properties. Uh, um, they took over commercial properties, they took over uh, the Alcoa area there, they took over some other factory properties and have now made them um, as part of a partnership. So it's F&M, the hospital, and the city, you know, really revitalizing areas as being, um, you know, strong uh, neighborhoods. And they, um, if you go up to um, Easton and Lafayette, they were, they're kind of up on the hill, and Easton is an urban, urban setting, urban corridor and uh, you know, distressed over the years, but they came, uh, Lafayette said, well, we're gonna come down into the city and we're gonna buy some buildings, some old blighted buildings, and we're gonna make them part of the um, community. So they did buy an old uh, car dealership and they bought some other old uh, warehouses and now they have their arts uh, building there and they have their, their bookstore. Um, so they, they're now part of that urban core. So the kids come down, students come down. The students come down and use the amenities that are now in Easton, um, and now this, the college is, now has a presence there. Um, if you go up to um, Lewisburg and you see Bucknell, they have a downtown presence in one of the old buildings, and they have their bookstore there, and they have a lot of uh, you know, interaction between the campus and between the, the downtown. Um, in Meadville, Allegheny College, um, has, has started to do a lot of that too. And of course, you know, in, in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, obviously, you can see the, the effects of Temple um, and Drexel and they're, you know, buying up properties around there to make the neighborhood stronger and to help the community. And what they're also doing is capacity building there too. So when they buy up a block of blighted properties, they're including the neighbors. They're, they're having the neighbors come to meetings and they're saying, look, we're, we're going to help and we'll help buy the blighted properties, but now you come to the meetings and you tell us what you'd like to see. What's happening here? Um, you know, crime is an issue. Crime in, in urban corridors is an issue. Um, but, you know, so, so I know that the neighbors, you know, most in those areas around the colleges, like, like a Temple or Drexel, you know, it's, it's safety, uh, public safety, but put up more lights. So the college helps and puts up more lights and they have a presence. They put up little amenities in those, in those neighborhoods and they fix the housing. They fix the housing for, for the neighbors. So it's not just college housing, it's not just student housing, but are, you, are, are they actually helping the neighborhoods? And they have found that to be very uh, productive, not just for the community, but for the college, because now they, they, the you know, parents feel a lot more comfortable sending kids there to the urban area because they're fixing up neighborhoods and making, making everything a little bit safer and cleaner. So, um, and also I think it is a good partnership between a, a community and a college to have that, that mix and that interaction. I, I like to see bookstores downtown, book, college bookstores are downtown, um, and so that, that, that draws to the downtown area. Um, might, you might have to walk a little farther, but um, it, it, it has a presence there. So, yeah, so. Um, I think, I don't know, I, that might be about it. 
Um, I did tell you that public service doesn't pay, so I did tell you that part, so I wanted to, want to reiterate that. But I did tell you that it was also very, um, uh, very rewarding. Oh, I know what I want to say. So, so um, just getting back kind of to that topic about leadership and about, and about um, promoting whatever it is that you want to promote. So all of you are in business, and when you get out, and I, um, we, we talked a little bit about this, about how you uh, sell yourself. And I think that when you, even when you have, whether you're doing community work or you're going to be out in the business, you guys are all going to be sellers. I know everybody goes, oh, I don't want to be in sales. Well, let me tell you, se selling an idea, selling a concept, selling a, uh, you know, a, a, a report that you're doing, there is a lot to involve to selling. And I can't stress that enough. We talked a little bit about, you know, your eye contact, your handshakes, okay? No, no fish handshakes, really strong handshakes. Um, the eye contact, the way you dress, and the way you present yourself. But there, I can tell you that all of you will be involved with selling at some time or another. Um, and it's, and again, selling, everybody goes, oh, I'm not gonna sell shoes, I'm not gonna be at McDonald's, I'm not gonna sell, sell stuff, but you are gonna sell, and really at a higher level. The idea of selling a concept, or selling a philosophy, or selling what you think is important, whether it's, again, whether you're doing a community-based kind of thing, it's selling door-to-door, -door, saying, hey, you gotta come out and you gotta help with this trash dump, and you, we're gonna make it a park, and you have to sell it. Or you're gonna be with your boss, and you're gonna have this report, and you're gonna go, well, you know, he's never gonna, he or she's never gonna look at this, or they don't, they're not paying any attention to me. You're gonna have to sell it. You're going to have to figure out a way to sell that idea. So um, I can't stress enough the, the um, and I, I'm not an expert on selling techniques, and I'm sure you've heard from others here on, on how to sell and how to present yourself. But I can tell you that selling um, is going to be part of your lives. Um, and you should keep that in mind of how you present a concept or an idea. Um, and, it, and again, it can be, as, you know, can be clever, or it just can be earnest. Um, but always have facts, always have data, because if you come in and say, oh my gosh, you know, this traffic pattern, look at that, you know, these people are going to get run over. Well, how, how do you know that? How many accidents have been there? How many people have actually gotten run over? How many people had to, how long did you have to wait at the corner before you had to cross? You know, do you have some statistics that can show, you know, why this intersection needs a light? Um, do you have statistics on this park? How many neighbors use it? Uh, maybe the park should be closed. Maybe after all this work, and hey, we really want to save this park, and everybody goes, eh, no, who uses it? Does anybody really use this park? Um, we've had a lot of that because we have a lot of pocket parks, and you know, they're, but they're important to the people around, but maybe not all the people around are at the table. So the people on the outer core are saying, eh, who uses that park anyway? So if you want to save that park, you've got to have your stats, and you've got to have your data, and you've got to have people come and say, yeah, you know, hey, I'm there all the time, and you know, my kids use it, and you know, people, people love to hang out there in the daytime you know, and, do, you know, and just get together. So um, you really have to think hard about um, your selling, uh, whether it's you, your ideas, your philosophies, your report, uh, your concept. And uh, there will be all kinds of, I know you guys are all, pretty tech savvy, so there'll be all kinds of cool things that you can do to, to get your idea across. But it is also personal. It really is personal. I've had a lot of um, people come to me with different ideas and concepts, and it's the people who are the most uh, energetic and have their information ready, and who are um, excited and passionate about whatever that idea is or that concept. Those are the, those are the people who get you, you know, because you have a passion and you, you really believe in whatever the concept is or the idea is. And so um, uh, you know, the presentation is very important. The passion is important. Uh, the necktie and the shirts, are, that's important. <laughs> Looking nice um, when you make your presentation. That's really, really important. So I think that's about it. Anybody have any questions? I want to see everybody out there doing some community project in your life sometime. Anything else for me? That's all I have. No questions? Yes. How do you guys fund all of your projects? I know you mentioned something earlier, but like how does So it, it depends on the project. Um, and again, we, okay, so let's, let's, let's give, we'll give a couple examples. So the, the example I talked about was a housing project. So we have, the city does, did not do the housing project, the Harrisburg Housing Authority. So that is a governmental, quasi-governmental agency and they get money from HUD. So they can 
they have that. But they have to partner with a private developer, and so there is, there is private development in affordable housing. So those are, the, those are the, um, the sources. Then they can go out and get low-income housing tax credits from, the, from HUD and also from the state agency, the um, Pennsylvania Housing Finance uh, Authority. They have tax credits, so that's how, and, and again, that's a strategy. When you sit down and you go, okay, it's a $16 million project. You know, who pays for each part of it? And then you go to those sources and you, you know, figure out who's going to pay for what. What's eligible? Um, HUD has really strict guidelines on how to fund these housing projects. So that part of it is, um, again, the city's part of it is just to be the host. We had to give them the land. They, they were blighted property, so we gave them land uh, because we were holding it for years, this blighted property. We, you know, so that helps it. The streetscape part of that project is funded by uh, state money, a grant. Um, and so that all is going to be funded. The city will put in probably a small match from their liquid fuels money, but again, that's, uh, that's state money. And then any other private part, parts of that whole housing project will be paid for by private, private money. Um, other projects that we've done. So the Harrisburg um, Senator Stadium, I don't know if any, ever, any of you have been there. It's an awesome stadium with a uh, minor league um, team that um, uh, is the support team for the Nats, the Washington Nationals. So um, it's an awesome, awesome stadium, and that was built with, again, with a lot of state dollars. So a lot of the state said, yep, you know, we like, and that was under Governor Rendell. He, he loved stadiums of all kinds, so he loved that stadium. And he, we put some, pri some public dollars in there, so it was tax dollars. But then again, a private developer came in and knew all about stadiums and said, okay, we're going to partner, and the senators, senators are, are part of that. So that's pri it's private. Um, when you look downtown, there's a lot of um, new apartments that are going on downtown, and that's through Harristown, and they're a development company, and so they'll, you know, they're, they're building that all on their own. Now, what the city does, what governments do, is when you want to incentivize, like you were saying, incentivize um, this kind of development, we do have a tax abatement program in the city. So that makes it more attractive than York or Lebanon or Lancaster. So if you come to Harrisburg, you get a 10-year tax abatement if you build if you build a, a cool tower or, or headquarters or something really cool. If you rehab, you can also get 100% um, tax credit. So uh, it's a tax abatement. So that's that abatement on your property tax for 10 years. So you know, there's, there is a role for government to play, but we don't have the money. We, we, we're not doing it. We're letting others do it. We're inviting them to do it. We're incentivizing them to do it, but that we don't, we don't have the money to do that. Our, our role, really, government's role is to make sure the people are at the table um, and safety. So we're in charge of fire and police, and that you know, we want to make sure, our, our, and, and then also um, trash cleanup and, and codes and that kind of thing. And we're also responsible for creating the environment for that development, so that's zoning. So how, where, do you want to, where do you want to build uh, a cool high-rise you know, uh, headquarters? Um, and please, you know, we don't really want a Walmart downtown. Well, and that's not true. We don't want a big warehouse kind of thing. But if Walmart, and I know Targets have the urban, urban models now where they go into an old building and it's, you know, three story, a three-story Target, we love that. But, you know, we, there are certain things that you wouldn't want. You wouldn't want a big warehouse Walmart on Riverfront. So there's zoning that protects, you know, that, that limits that kind of building. So that's all urban planning. And I don't think there are any urban planners in here yet, right? These are all business people. I'll check back with you, though. Urban planning is really awesome. So anybody who wanted to leave business and go into urban planning, <laughs> it's a great field. Um, and I was, saying, I was just saying to, you, to your professor that uh, I'm actually a biology major. My degree's in biology. So you just never know what's going to happen. I started in biology. I thought I was going to be a researcher or go into the medical field. And then I, when I graduated, I got a, bit, a job in a business factory, and I was doing business stuff, and I just loved it. So who knew? So then, then I just I ran for office, and you know the rest is history. But go ahead. I was wondering, what's going to be about the new pipeline that's going to cross the strait? Across mm -hmm. the strait? Do you know if that's impacting any sort of like civic or urban development in any way? Yeah, it's impacting farmers mostly. It's impa impacting the farmers and the landowners. Um, when you say is it impacting development, I don't, I, I don't think so because they're, they're building the pipeline, that, so they got easements to cross the property, and then they're burying it. Um, but I think that they are able to build around it or, you know, whatever. I think the development will, ha will happen. I think what's, what's happening is farmers are, you know, farmers are distraught, and also the, the impact on the environment is the biggest thing. If there's a, the people are afraid that if there's a leak, um, and they have had some accidents already, that that's a problem for our water, water sources. 
Uh, and again, you know, if you, if you think about it, okay, we have this big turnpike. I mean, think about how old that turnpike is. I guarantee you, you would not be able to build that turnpike today. You couldn't. There'd be so many objections and bog turtles and wetlands and people protesting, taking their farms. So, you know, is progress, you know, you have to balance it. Is progress worth that, you know, worth that, um, you know, that, that give and take of land and, you know, development? But, um, yeah, so. Any other, Any questions? other questions? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you see a big difference in the effectiveness of urban development and economic development um, between Ed Rendell and the proposed governor or the opposite? Absolutely. It's huge. So, um, and again, you guys are going to have to think of, the, of how you view these philosophies. So, Ed Rendell came in. And he loved urban, the urban cities. You know, like I said, Erie, Warren, Chester, Lebanon, York. And he set aside and made sure that there was funding for um, urban revitalization. And I oversaw a lot of those funds. So I was at the Department of Community and Economic Development. And there was 32, in this one particular line item, which was a legislated line item, was $32 million. Okay, so we took that money and we built stadiums and we built, uh, we renovated old buildings like the Evangelical Press, which is downtown Harrisburg. It was an old press built. I mean, there's there's just so many um, downtown Lebanon where the where the market is. We re took money and we we redid those things. So when Corbett came in, he zeroed out that line item. So zero. We went from 32 million to zero. So that, that, and then the pretty much decimated that department. So that department hardly has any money for Main Street, Elm Street, you know, any kind of urban revitalization because he just, you know, the, the Republican um, philosophy was that there wasn't any reason to help those communities in that way with tax dollars. And um, I guess my, you know, my thinking and looking around is if you don't have some kind of public help, developers won't come in. All right, so, so now that, that line item is zero, right? So there's no money. So we have to do things like tax abatement. So Harrisburg has to, the, the taxpayers are now going to give up their tax dollars because there isn't, there isn't any money to incentivize people, the private developers. So they can go anywhere. They can build, developers can build out in a farm in you know, Lebanon and a farm in Lancaster. If, I'm telling you, doing green space is much cheaper because they just buy up the land. It's, all, it's a blank canvas and hey, I'm building whatever I need to build and the township supervisors are gonna say great and that's fine. But um, to build in urban areas is much more difficult because you have old buildings and you have old infrastructure. And so that zeroing out that line item has had a profound effect on urban redevelopment because developers, you know, so you've got your business plan and you know you want to get at least a 10% return on your money and they, you do the numbers and you say, hey, if I have to do this old building, I have to do infrastructure, I have to demolish, I have to remove asbestos, I have to uh, make sure the traffic patterns are, are, are tight within that area. I'm not going to do it. I'm going out to the farm. But if we had state money, like under Rendell, that encouraged that and said the, the communities and the state would say, okay, Mr. Developer, we'll demolish that building for you. We'll clean it up. We'll take out the asbestos. We'll clean it up. And now you have a, a blank space, so you have a, a cool building. And you put the rest of it in there, and you make it apartments. You make it office, office space, um, and you, know, you can, you can locate, you know, locate there. So yeah, there's a big, there is a huge difference in philosophies there. No, no, because we have a Republican legislature that also not not very interested in funding that. No. So. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks. Thank you.